Floyd is a multimedia artist interested in illuminating and critiquing structures of power. Floyd's art practice reflects on historical, social, political patterns of injustice and oppression and how they inform and organize life today. In film, vid video, sound installations, interventions, and site-specific works, Woods challenges the rigidity of documentary film, ethnography, and law. Her work has been exhibited throughout the United States and internationally, including in Washington, D.C., New York, Dallas, Los Angeles, Japan, South Korea, and France. She has been the recipient of grants and awards from numerous institutions, including the Tribeca Film, Fun the Tribeca film Foundation, College Arts Association, and the San Francisco Foundation. Foundation. Her recent exhibition, American Monument, opened last weekend at the University of California, Irvine's Beale Center for the Arts and Technology. It is an honor to have Lauren Woods speak tonight. Please assist me in welcoming her. I'll need a copy of that. Your, that's my new bio. <laughs> <laughs> it's way overdue. I wrote it in grad school. Okay. I'm obsessed with history and the archives. My fascination began at a very young age upon viewing the original PBS episodic broadcast of Eyes on the Prize. In the comfort of my mother's lap, I learned about the civil rights movement, a defining moment in self-construction. Finally, I had a context for the scar that still remains, even to this day, on my mother's right hand. It's a smooth aberration that I found comforting when I used to hold her hand as a child. Despite all of our conversations about it years prior, I really began to comprehend the origins of that scar. The results of an elderly white man assaulting my mother as a child when she dared to board the bus before him. Because history is all that makes the present coherent, as asserted by James Baldwin, those Sunday nights of viewing the visual tapestry at the intersection of history and cinema, public television, public memory, public art, allowed my seven-year-old self a deeper understanding of the world that I was a part of. Somehow, I managed to d manage, despite the spectacle of violence, to take away something powerful. And so, I begin here. you know, a, a like important like um, moment and a, a moment I'm really grateful for. It's like my head is in so many other places to think about like the art that I did before. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking about Botham Jean. I'm thinking about the hug seen around the world from the judge, yes. <laughs> you know? I'm thinking about can art do more than represent the issue? And so, it's really difficult actually for me to go through this right now. Um, so what am I gonna do? Okay, this is what I'm gonna do. Okay, since I stopped it. Um, I'm gonna just share like a couple of things, a couple of, I had a slide called Notes on Public Memory and Process. 
I'll start there. So you, so that, that slideshow was just like a little bit of what my studio work kind of looks like and manifest as, um, which is video based. Um, I'm you know dealing at the intersection both public and interpersonal issues of race, memory, um, and then my public work sort of traces race to the built environment. And so um, really the last I would say six years solid, I've been mostly working. Um, in public and dialogical processes. And so I'll, I'll kind of start there to give you a little basis for how we came to American Monument, and then we'll just get into American Monument because I also have my collaborators here, um, Kimberly Meyer, and our new collabor collaborator, David Familian, who is hosting us at the Bill. So they're here, they can also speak with me on the project. So I think I'd rather just do that. Yay. Okay. <laughs> All right. So. Um, notes on public memory and process. So there's, there's two places I'd like to start. The first experiments I did in, in public space was while I was still a grad student at San Francisco Art Institute. Um, at the time, I had moved to San Francisco from Texas, um, and I was um, looking for black people. <laughs> people were always like go over the bridge go to Oakland and I always found that really strange because if you were in New York like you wouldn't have to go to Brooklyn or the Bronx to find black people and I lived in the city proper at the time I lived in Haight Street you know I could literally like I lived on Haight Street so I could literally count in a day how many black people I saw and like one maybe one and a half hands right so about midway through my first semester there I finally made it over over the bridge to um a flea market called the Berkeley, uh, Berkeley Free Flea Market. And it's a historical flea market that was started in the 60s by different activist groups to raise money for the different causes of the 60s, and it's still going, right? And so sort of a people's market that like funnels money to different um, people's grassroots organizations. And so I went there, and you know, you get off on the BART station at the Ashby station, and immediately you hear a drum circle you get out, and I was just like, oh my god, yes, like this is, this is where I find black people apparently. And, and it was like, you know, it felt kind of like home. And so at the time, I was, um, you know, a new student at San Francisco Art Institute. I, my concentration was film. Um, I, shoot, I shot and shoot both 16 millimeter, 8 millimeter, and video. So um, at the time, I was really thinking about or and working with the idea of the ethnographic and my like relationship to representation and ethnography and ethnofictive um, practices. So I went back with the camera and I recognized how nervous I felt. And so I kind of made this pseudo ethnofictive uh, um, hybrid 16 millimeter video piece. And you know, at the time, I was like slowly moving out of just a studio practice. I felt it wasn't sufficient in terms of my upbringing um, and uh, leaning toward um, uh, activist movements. Uh, or you know, I was raised by an activist family. That's very much a part of me. So for me, it was like, how do I take my work and build a larger, or make the work large, accessible to a larger audience? It's always been sort of important to me. So um, I made this video, and I was like, or video, hybrid video film, and I decided that I would go back to the flea market and premiere it there. And uh, I was, you know, kind of going in the, the, the tradition of Jean Rouge, who is the French filmmaker. He's considered the father of, of African cinema, which is problematic because he's a white French man. <laughs> but, <laughs> but at the time, he was um, making um, some of the first ethnographic films in Africa that really started to deconstruct the role of the other, right? So he would go and he would train people in different villages to actually use the camera. He would do his dailies there in the village. And then they also had this interesting sort of happening where in, in, it became known as um, cine trance, which is the idea of like the filmmaker inserting himself into whatever was happening and then the film becoming like part of the whole movement. And there's also some fiction because the people who were the subjects were also acting as well, acting out <coughs> the, the, or the ethnographic life as the other, right? So I was like, okay, let me take this film back to the Ashby Flea Market, and um, I became a vendor. I certified myself as a vendor, got a tent, showed the film for two days, uh, or every weekend for a couple of weekends from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. on a loop in a tent. 
And at first I was like, you know, I'm giving back, like I'm doing it, I'm giving, whatever. Um, <laughs> and, I was, and, and this was really my first experiment in public space. It really, like, um, I began to understand that, like, I don't need to do anything for people. I'm making an offering. And actually the flea market didn't need my film, right? So, like, so those first, like, weekends, uh, people would kind of come to the tent and they'd be like, what's going on in here? What you got for sale? And I'd be like, it's nothing. It's free. It's a film. And they were just like, okay, you know? <laughs> and um, what I understood was that the people who lived the flea market didn't actually need to see that sort of representation of the market. The people who actually stayed were the people from the outside that I had sent invitations to and invited, right? So that was my first sort of experiment that really started to make, like, get me to understand a little bit what it meant to practice um, in community, in public, and what actually started to formulate my intentions around that. So um, that was the first experiment. So uh, around 2010, I was invited uh, by Kimberly Meyer and the Mac Center uh, to be part of a, um, a, a show of 22 commissioned billboards. And so this was the first major time um, that I actually had a, a major work out in public space that wasn't sort of an independent one-off thing I was doing. Um, and so at the time, I had moved from San Francisco to uh, Dallas. I was an artist in residence at Central Track there to work on what I'll show you later, which was my, my major long-term project, the Dallas Drinking Fountain Project. So I had moved there, and Max Center had invited me to do this billboard. Well, at the time, I was like, I don't know. All of, all of my process involved um, understanding the community the work was going in, responding to site, responding to history of the site. And with the billboard show, I had none of that context, right? So the idea was that um, three billboard companies that offered space during the time that LA was uh, debating um, the amount of billboards in public space. And, and, and Kimberly, please feel free to <laughs> jump in if I have anything right, wrong or right. Um, and so the billboard companies were like, okay, as when we have extra space, we'll, we'll put a billboard in, right? And there was kind of no rhyme or reason, it was just sort of a list, right? And so apparently, from what I understand, um, I was um, in, in queue next to Corey Newkirk's work. And it was my work was supposed to go in another location, and for some reason that billboard company decided Corey Newkirk's work was too controversial to put in the space that I ended up being in. And so they switched us up, right? So Corey Newkirk's work, which if anybody remembers seeing this billboard or this show, or you should look at the catalog, it's an amazing um, show of artists. Um, Corey's work was a, a, an image, a, blown, a medium shot image of him, nude from bust up with a huge snowball in his mouth, kind of like a ball gag s &M thing, right? So, <laughs> and for those of you know, who know Corey Newkirk as an artist, he's a black man, so he had a huge white snowball in his mouth that looked like a ball gag and something. Is that the correct s &M term, like ball gag? <laughs> okay, is that what it is? It's like, you know, okay. So um, they decided that where this was going, which was the corner of Fairfax and Melrose in West Hollywood, was too controversial. So they put my billboard in a place, um, and mine, it, was, it was the only billboard company from what I remember that would actually take my work. Um, so they didn't see a problem with the work, so they put it in place instead of Corey's. Now, who knows the corner of Fairfax and Melrose in West Hollywood, and what is that neighborhood? Jewish. Historically Jewish. Jewish. Right, so this billboard went there. Now what this billboard is, it's a Urdu couplet by a poet from the, mid, um, uh, from the medieval times named Vali Dakani. Um, it reads, as long as earth and sky last, smile like a flower in the garden of the world. Um, it's Urdu, and Urdu uses the Arabic script. So just to give you a little anecdotal story, um, I had um, flown in for the opening of this, of this show and I land in LAX, uh, my best friend had just moved from New York and she picked me up and I had just had, I had, okay, also this is another thing, I moved to Texas and had like a secret baby. So I was like bringing this like <laughs> three month old baby back. And, and so I, you know, I'm getting strollers and things like that. 
And my, my, my friend comes up and she barely hugs me and looks at the new baby and she's like, Lauren, what have you done? And I'm like, what are you talking about? She's like, oh my gosh, I just had lunch with my friend. She's a lawyer, by the way. Her friend's a lawyer. Her friend lives in the neighborhood. She goes, just had friends, lunch with my friend and I was telling her, I'm going, my friend's coming in town, I'm going to the opening celebrations of this billboard show. And my friend was just like, well, going off on this billboard. And apparently she's like, you know, there's this Arabic billboard in my neighborhood. And so Christina was like, um, hmm, you know? And the more she described, she goes, I think that's my friend Morris. <laughs> <laughs> and so her friend, which actually I ended up meeting her later, um, was like, I don't care. And so Christina was like, well, I think it's a love poem or something. Like, I think it's, it's okay. And she's like, I don't care if it says I love Jews. It doesn't need to be in this neighborhood. So immediately, Christina's telling me all of this as I get off the plane. Mind you, I conceived this billboard in the middle of Texas. So the way I came to this work was that um, the Fort Hood shootings in Texas had just happened, which if anybody knows what that is, it was the, the Muslim American soldier who opened fire on a um, army base in Texas, right? So the discourse in the middle America, mind you, was lit, okay? And so I was in Texas when I thought of, when I thought about this bill, or when I thought I had to come up with the commission, right? Or, and I had like a couple of ideas, but for some reason, this really started sticking. In my head, I imagined what would it mean to have this in Texas? What would it mean to have this in Middle America? I was like, in California, it's like not a big deal. Um, you know, it's like I, I didn't even think about the other conflict. I was thinking about general American Islamophobia, right? And um, and then the other way that I came to the work is is really kind of um, petty a little bit, but it's. Obama had just been elected. I heard a Al Jazeera report where he was like, I'm a lover of the great Urdu poets. And I was like, you know, I need to know what those are because I'm going to have a drink with him one day and I can talk about Urdu poetry. Like, it was that simple. So I was like, I was into, <laughs> I, was into I was getting into Urdu poetry. So when this commission came up, it was like, these were the things that were kind of swirling. And I, you know, have always been in love with that area of the world, the script, the artistry, everything. So I was like, you know, let me see what it means to put this um, respond to site in a different way, which meant that I didn't know where it was going to be. I didn't know the history of the community, but I was responding to the site of billboard, right? So I was, I was really thinking about text, image, all of those things that make these sort of huge commercial signs. So I was really responding to the site of the billboard when I came up with this. So to get to California and to hear this immediately landing, I was like, shit. This is not what I intended. I like respect the places that the work goes into, and I normally would want to work with community and not like provoking. So I was totally expecting. I went, you know, got to the hotel the next morning, met up with Kimberly, totally expecting to hear like the billboard's coming now. <laughs> and Kimberly, I like literally braced when I saw her, and I was like, so. Um, my friend, you know, <laughs> was telling me, and Kim was like, yeah, we've had some calls. <laughs> and I was like, okay, so, you know, is it coming down? And Kim was like, well, you know, I think this is something we need to, like, talk about. I think that, you know, so what I didn't intend was the discussion of the Israeli-Palestinian issue, right? But the reasonings that were coming in against the billboard was still seeped in some, for some form of xenophobia, right? So, and Kimberly, as the director of the museum, was like, I think it's, I think this is what we need to have a discussion about. So from my understanding, people were allowed, like people called up and um, were facilitated through dialogue around the work. And that was my first time work, actually working with Kimberly Meyer, who has years, now a decade later, we're working on this. But it really stuck to me. And actually, and Sarah Delano was on that. That's when I first met you, which is another story. And, um, so it really stuck to me in terms of uh, the steward of the institution believing in the power of, of culture and art enough to like enact dialogical and restorative processes and not sort of be afraid of what's to come potentially, right? So um, just to read you a little note uh, from that catalog. Cultural and collective memory, historical narratives, social psychology, and the politics of gender, class, race, nationhood are some of the themes that Lauren Woods commonly taps in her work. The text on her billboard is in Urdu. It's translated as follows. 
As long as earth and sky last, smile like a flower in the garden of the world. It is from a love poem by a prolific Urdu poet of, of the medieval period, Vali Dakani, who is credited with inventing the poetic form of gazel, consistently, consisting of rhyming couplets and, and of refrain. Dakani also inspired poets of Delhi to switch from the writing in Persian, the language of the upper class, to writing in Urdu, which was the common language of the people. For many in Los Angeles, the image of a poem on the billboard does not transmit its meaning because most of us read, read neither Arabic script nor the Urdu language. Language without legibility provides a kind of canvas upon which the viewer may project assumptions, passions, and fears. In post 9-11 America, this particular foreign language can appear both beautiful and vaguely threatening. Urdu is a national language of Pakistan, one of the most active hotspots for global tension right now. Woods presents this opportunity for mass projection as a chance for self-reflection. The work sets up a moment in which the viewer is prompted to observe her assumptions and possibly evaluate her prejudices. Woods' piece insists on seeing the beauty in distant cultures, especially when these cultures have been associated with enemies of the state or of our nation. It also plays with the idea of messaging, delivering a di directive from a distant century, language, alphabet, and culture, yet one with an arguably universal meaning and contemporary relevance. And so that was from the, the catalog that Kimberly wrote, or the blurb that Kimberly wrote. And so again, like, if, and you can kind of see, um, again, why I would be interested in Vali Dakani to begin with, the idea of switching from the language of the um, upper class to the language of the people, and that being sort of a really revolutionary moment at that time. So I got into his poetry, you know, through Obama, but then after it. <laughs> um, so, so that was 2010. So, in the background, I have been working on this project um, uh, since uh, Dallas Drinking Fountain Project, a uh, project that became known as that since about 2005. Um, but I'm going to start. The, the story of this starts in 2003, which was the year that I actually moved to um, San Francisco from Dallas. And so for decades, a seemingly innocuous metal plate that was screwed into the marble wall above a public drinking fountain in the Dallas County Records Building, one day, or it, excuse me, it, um, a metal plate that it was screwed into the marble wall hung above a public drinking fountain in the Dallas County Records Building in Dallas, Texas. One day in early 2003, it fell off. A public outcry ensued as people learned what this metal plate was meant to cover up, which was traces of Jim Crow, a Jim Crow-era white-only sign that was removed during desegregation. The metal plate inadvertently <coughs> preserved the memory that, I was meant, that it was meant to help erase. Upon further study, the county realized that, in fact, all of the drinking fountains in the building had these metal plates attached to the wall above them, and behind those plates, were the remainder of uh, this country's racist institutions. The fate of these artifacts fell before the Dallas County Commissioner's Court to decide. A months long public debate and process ensued, and at one point even making national headlines. Vote after vote ended in a stalemate as the court could not come to a consensus on whether to preserve or to destroy the trace etched into the marble wall. Finally in March, the commissioners decided in a controversial four to one decision to meet in the middle. They would deem the drinking fountain locations as site of historical, sites of historical significance by keeping the artifacts in, on public view, unpreserved, and installing interpretive signage to discuss the, quote, historical, social, and legal significance of such segregation error signage. So at the time, I was preparing to move to San Francisco to begin uh, grad school at San Francisco Art Institute. And I was um, in complete agreement with the decision to keep and this was a minority opinion in the city, especially amongst uh, vocal um, black members of the community. Um, but I was in the agreement that the county shouldn't destroy the artifacts, but I did believe that to really address the moment in a transformative way that it had to go a step further. So in 2005, I went before the county commissioner's court with this proposal. At the time, I was still a grad student. I was probably, I was thinking I was about 24 years old. And I was just starting to move out of film and sort of the, um, the really, I don't know how it is here, okay? But I know how it was at San Francisco Art Institute. Filmmakers were kind of like segregated off to the side. They weren't really part of like contemporary art like education. And I'll, let you, I'll keep it 100, like I failed. I like failed my review, I got an F. I have an F on my transcript. <laughs> and, and at the time, you know, 
the film department was like, you know, this is this is cute, this is cool. You need to move over to new genres. And I was like, um, I was like, <laughs> and I was like, no, I'm staying here, which I did. But I actually, after I failed, I was like, okay, let me just, you know, take some other classes. So I started taking painting critiques, like critiques with painters. I did try to take a new genre class. I dropped out of it. Um, but I did stay, I was committed to the film department, right? Um, because I did work with film, but I was just like working in an expanded way um, that at the time, um, you know, wasn't meeting the bar for my, my review. Um, so, but I did start to have disorder. So this is my introduction really to contemporary art. I came from a film background. My undergraduate degree is in traditional radio, television, film. Um, I have a Spanish and sociology degree. Um, even as an undergrad, I would have to argue about my grade and they'd try to send me to art school, or the art department. I was like, I don't know what you do with an art degree, so no, like I need money. So, <laughs> which <laughs> turns out, whatever. So, um, <laughs> Um, so, so yeah, so again, I found myself again in grad school sort of being pushed off to something else. I knew nothing about art. I had not taken ever an art history class, nothing. Like, that was all part of my graduate studies. So, but, so the good thing about failing was that, like, it forced me to kind of open up, like, my world. And that's when I actually started to, like, learn what the world of contemporary art, art was. And at that moment, I remember I took a class with Terry Cohen, I believe her name is, and Terry Cohen, and she had a class called Margins to the Center where we learned about um, monumentality. We studied um, monuments. And um, I was like, I was like, this is my shit, you know? Like, so we, I learned about uh, Maya Lin, I learned about Eisenman's uh, Memorial to the Murdered Jews in, in Berlin. And I started sort of like, absorbing all of this and then thinking back to this moment in Dallas and I was like well what do monuments we've, we've gone through the fate or we've gone to we've gone from his, um, his, his heroic figure on a pedestal monuments to spatial monuments what's the next thing how do we really integrate new media because that's my basis into public memory so I thought about this um, place in Dallas um, and all the discourse around it, and I was like, I want to make a, a new media monument at this place. Okay, very naive, I was in school. Um, I, decide, I called up the city um, art commission, and they informed me because the relic was in a county building that I couldn't work with that institution. So um, I just called up the county commissioners like at admin offices, and they were just like, we don't know what to do with this, because they had no sort of art department. So they're just like, well, let's just see. After a few calls, they were like, let's just put you before the commissioner's court and see what happens, you know? So, like, so I flew back, you know, um, right before my third semester, I think, of, of grad school with this proposal, and I was so proud of myself. I had it briefs and like prints and everything else. Um, and uh, at the time, they put me on the, the docket as number 33. At the time, they had been arguing, this court like really likes to argue, so they had been arguing a billion dollar budget cut issue. And so they couldn't come to any consensus, so the judge like throws down the gavel and he's like, okay, next. He's like, number 33, we have um, art, we have to, <laughs> like it was literally like that. It was like, we have to do, like, okay, there's some artists here with, some, with a proposal for art. Like it was literally like that. <laughs> so, <laughs> So I like bring up my little notes, you know, and they're just all looking at me over their like, you know, high like, um, like place that they're sitting. And so this is from that day of proposal. Historic artistic display. Yeah. Very, very specific. <laughs>
your DJ card because they will, even if you tell them your name's not Butterfly, they will reprint it. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it was funny because like, I was like cringing. I'd just become Lauren Woods because I was told in grad school I couldn't be Butterfly anymore. And, um, and then it was butter <laughs> Butterfly, but people knew me in Dallas as that. So, I mean, I guess it worked, but um, yeah. Um, so, so yeah, so 20, so basically I was like, okay, I had to learn as an individual, because I had no art commission to work with, like how do I launch this, like what became a major public like F or artwork in the public sphere as an art commission of one, right? So it took me about, it took me eight years to get this project launched. I had to raise the money. I, I will share what the budget was. It was $180,000. Um, yeah, it was $180,000 and it didn't even complete itself. So I raised about 150 of it and the last 30 I didn't to do the public programs. Um, I also had a secret baby in the middle of that. That's also why it took a little bit longer. <laughs> yes, I had a baby like right out of breath. It was a secret, it was, it was not, it was, a, it was a surprise. He was a surprise of a nine year old. Um, I, I, and I call it a secret because I literally went with the baby in utero to this residency because I was afraid they'd kick me out as a single woman with the child in Texas. So I literally had a baby in my studio <laughs> eventually. <laughs> Uh, and then I kept him there, and he was a residency baby. Right? I was like, you can't do anything now. I mean, it ended up being fine, but um, I was afraid, moving from California, what would happen. Um, at the time, so in 2010, as I told you guys, and I, I worked on the project at the Mac Center, I met Sarah Delighton, who was working on the public engagement for that show. And so, she, like, witnessing her process was amazing, and I, like, basically reached out to her and begged her to, like, become part of my art commission of one. So we now became an art commission of two. Um, Sarah would come back and forth to Dallas and, um, and she really helped me to launch this work. And I like to call her um, my art doula for this work. Um, because um, I think that I really started to like um, develop a certain politic that really affects how I work now. Which is um, one, I had to let go of all of my like ideas of what it meant to like look like the professional artist that's taken seriously because I was a single mother with a new baby and broke, okay, <laughs> raising money for this project that was a huge stressor because I felt if I didn't finish raising the money, then I had to give this money back, and um, you know that would have felt really like 
like at the beginning of motherhood and the beginning of my career that would have been really detrimental. Um, so I learned how to work with the child with, in the residency and also like bringing him to all these like county commissioner meetings and stuff because I have no babysitting, right? And so here I had this baby like reaching into my bra to breastfeed while I'm talking to county commissioners and being like, oh my God, I'm so sorry, you know? And, and like, but then I had to like let go of like these sort of divisions that say like this has to look this way and like, you know, children shouldn't be around when we're conducting, conducting business. And actually it was all in my head because Literally, everyone was so supportive. Benjamin grew up with this project, basically, up until the age of five, uh, or three when we launched it, four when we launched it. But he would, by the, by the end of that process, he would, I could bring him to the records build, or to the administration, and he would, I could let him crawl around while I had my meetings, and he knew where to get fruit snacks from what secretary. And it was like, great. And, and, and then um, at the records building itself, like people got really used to sort of caretaking while I was working there. Um, so that really did start to set up some, some ways that I began working um, that still affects now. And also, and, and it's really developing sort of a feminist practice and way of working um, that involves heavily working with women that understand like what this looks like the mess and the like positives of it, right? And I really credit Sarah for like being there witnessing those baby steps, right? So for time's sake, I'll skip through this. Well, actually, no, I'm gonna just, uh, I'm gonna try to show you so you guys can see. Even, um, oh, let me let it go. So this was uh, two, a month out of uh, the unveiling. because again, I didn't have babysitting for Benjamin and he wouldn't stay out of the shot. And, and so even then I was like kind of sweating because I was like, here I am again looking, you know, whatever, I'm professional. And they were like, no, we're just gonna do some B-roll with Benjamin and then we'll edit whatever this is together. Um, but I also wanna speak to one thing. I realize I'm, I, I actually didn't explain why I call it the secret baby or pregnancy. It was because literally my career had just started when I found my, out about my pregnancy. I graduated in 2016. 
2009, I became pregnant. I decided to go ahead with motherhood. And at the time, I, a gallerist I was working with basically told me like my career was done. Um, other, and I had that a few sort of not as explicit um, utterance or you know um, saying that, but there was the idea of that. And, and I think that things have shifted a little bit in the last 10 years, but at the time, this was pretty much like a common thought in terms of women. Women have to sort of disappear to raise the kid and then they'll come back after the kids are in high school or college and maybe they'll have a career, right? And so I was like, you know, I'm a Taurus, so I couldn't think of what to do, like, except for my plan, right? And so, which is why I was like, I'm going to this residency, I'll have the baby, they don't have to know about it. But, um, the, <laughs> but I also, at the time, I had received the first major grant for this project I was raising money on, it was with the Creative Capital Foundation. So I had to, I, I had, at the time, I had put, my intention was that I put my apartment on sublease in San Francisco, and my thought was that before I found out I was pregnant, I literally found out the same day I put my, I moved out of my apartment, um, but I thought that I would do this sort of like, um, sort of couch surfing thing until the residency started in the fall, because um, I had some sort of engagements all over, and then I would do this project here in Dallas for two years, and I'd kind of go east, and then I'd make my way back to San Francisco, that was always the intention. And um, then I found out I was pregnant, and I was like, well, okay. So I kept my like couch surfing routine up, and I ended up at the Creative Capital Retreat um, when after I re received that award, and I was hiding the pregnancy. And um, a woman that was on the board that ended up becoming my professional development mentor, Colleen Keegan, who's this amazing woman, she, at the last night of the party, she looked at me across the room, and she like literally whispered, she's like, <laughs> and I was like, you know, she's like, come here. And so she's like, why are you hiding? And I was just like, because I've, you know, like I've, I've, I've had this said to me. And she's like, look, this is your business. You can choose to tell it or not. It's not something you have to declare as like an apologetic way. She's like, you can share it, you can't. She's like, your, doctor's, your doctor doesn't tell you his wife's at home having a baby. Like, you don't have to go and say, I'm sitting down for this job interview, I'm having a baby. You don't have to do that. But it's nothing to hide. So she's like, I'm gonna, she's, she chooses her people she mentors. So she was like, I'm gonna be your mentor. And really she's just been like a sort of support system anytime I've had like a like moment where I've been, I've felt insecure, right? So just to say, like, this has become like me becoming a mother and the sort of like, um, path of my career literally have been in tandem. Um, so, okay, so we get to um, 2013 and we finally get to unveil. We're not exactly sure what's going to happen because Jim Crow has come down this building. <laughs> <laughs> and created this whole new era of the world. So we're going to have to figure out and hardship it took to get there, people showed up and the county was surprised because they're used to like dedicating bridges and roads and like nobody shows up to that, right? There were like 200 people in this small hallway to see this thing unveil, but they like were using the bathroom and like fucking up the plumbing, right? So like what happened, like, so what happened was like we tested it and the water was, a little, was literally like, psh, and I was like, oh my God, this is the whole point of the fountain, we need water and it was just like, really flaccid. <laughs> and so I was just like, oh my God, I was like, Sarah, 
I need water, you know? And I had, I like had to go put on makeup. And so I told the like the, the collaborators and facilities man, I was like, we need water. Like just give me one ceremony, ceremonial drink. We'll, we'll turn it off and it's fine. And so they were like, okay. So they, when I came back, they're like, we just busted it up. We don't know what's gonna happen. And I was like, just give me a bucket, it'll be fine. So when that happened, no one was expected. I think we were expecting it just was gonna kind of land maybe, and it like shot up, like it was like literally a jet stream. And the front page of the news ended up be me being like holding a bucket <laughs> and the commissioner, and you know, I'm you know very much a like Freudian psychoanalysis person of, of images. So I literally looked like he was like pissing in the bucket or like <laughs> other things in the bucket, if you read it Freud, right? Like, very psychosexual, and I like cried for weeks. Sarah can attest to, <laughs> attest to this because I was like, "This was we shall overcome." <laughs> and literally, this bro made this like psychosexual image be the front page of the newspaper. It ended up being my favorite image, but like just to say that, you know, I thought it would be something else, and it actually ended up what it was was perfect, right? Like it wasn't your traditional like civil rights monument and we're you know kind of having a somber moment like people were like overjoyed and one of the women um in, in at those at the opening or the unveiling came to me she was like that wasn't jim crow that was the ancestors coming through and i was like that's the way like we can flip it right so um so that so that's the drinking fountain number one the project is this um let me just skip through oh that's an image <laughs> Sculpture is called Drinking Fountain Number One. The project's actually in three parts. So there's the fountain, but also there are the um, the public programs running as well, right? So there, in the records building, there was an unused uh, visitors desk from a long time ago. The building is from the 19 early 1900s. So I kind of made myself the official artist in residence, but I was unofficial. And uh, it really allowed me to observe like how, well first of all, before the fountain launch, I did site visits in that way where I just sit for hours and do site, and do site observation. And then afterwards, I became sort of like a pseudo employee, right? People would come and ask me where like to go, but I'd also be there when people were there to stop at the fountain as well. And there was a lot of really um, generative and generous conversations around that and that actually allowed me to sort of like just make more notes about working in public. Um, so the idea was always to have these public programs that would reactivate the civic space, but I couldn't raise the money for it um, by the time of the opening. And I actually was just exhausted, right? So the third part of it was a cartographic website as well that would map other sites of contested public memory. Again, didn't finish raising the money and ra ran out of steam. But I was able to um, do a little bit of experimentation. So let me run through, just to show you the site and the unveiling. This was an important image because um, this is the commissioner, uh, Price, who was the main proponent of the project, and he was a Democrat. And uh, at the time, Jim Jackson was also, when, the, when they approved the fountain, was a commissioner that became a senator. And he, had, and he was a Republican, and they were always fighting. But this was the one thing that they worked together on. So um, Senator Jackson came back to unveil with Commissioner Price. Um, so there's the everything. And you can kind of see the trades. So what I was able to do though, even though I haven't gotten the public programs running, was a little bit of experiments with site activation. So in 2014 to 2015, um, the project was able to host a couple of things. We held a, a press conference for Mothers Against Police Brutality um, there. Um, we had um, a group called, um, a program called Dallas in Context that was part of the National Facing Race Conference that came to Texas that year. Um, and then we also hosted the Workers' Defense Project and Texas Organizing Project. So just to show you some images from there. This is Colette Flanagan, the founder of Mothers Against Police Brutality. Cornell West had come to support Mothers Against Police Brutality, so he was also there at the press conference. This was uh, me giving a little presentation on public process and public memory. And then this was really what was important to me, and this was actually like where I want the project to go in terms of the public program. So, um, 
I hosted um, a organizer from the Workers' Defense Project. And the Workers' Defense Project is an organization that is advocating in Texas for, um, for uh, construction worker and labor rights. And most of the people that they're advocating for are undocumented. So at the time in Texas, they were doing a campaign to get a water break legislated for construction workers. Because in Texas, you don't have to give people a water break working in construction. Mind you, Texas has like 100 degree weather in the summer, right? So literally, they were working on a campaign for water breaks during the time that they came to speak, and, and really like tying it to like that like symbolism of water, right? Um, and sort of the, the continuum of civil rights movements. Um, so that was really important, a really special moment. And then we also hosted um, Ed Turner of the Texas Organizing Project, who was also to, that was there to discuss the dismantling of the school to prison pipeline efforts that was happening in Dallas with DISD at the time. So again, the idea of the public programs and reactivating that space was to make the link between historical civil rights movements to what's happening now. And the idea was that that fountain would always collect videos, right, that um, started with the newsreel from the civil rights movement, but eventually I, the plan was to add more videos in. Now, I'm speaking in the past because actually the fountain is down now. They've actually uh, gutted that entire building and they're renovating it. So they want to, they're dedicated to bringing it back, so it'll come back as drinking fountain number two. Um, I'm really trying to work through it because the whole sort of um, framework for the project is different since it's not a intervention anymore and like what does that mean to actually bring this like white only trace back into the space and have it have its own special like I'm just working that out but um, if, if, if it all makes sense it'll be um, unveiled in the next in, in a year from now with the building um, opening grand reopening again okay so that took me a long time um, but uh, now I've gotten to American Monument, and we have what, about another 30 minutes? Uh, yeah, about 30? 20. 20? Okay. Yeah. So how do I speed through this? <laughs> so we can have questions. I mean, how many people have, I know about what happened? How much do I have to go through? Or how about if you don't know what happened? No. Feel free. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see. Where do I begin? Where do I begin? Okay, so this project starts. Um, let me just explain a little bit about the origins of the project. It starts in 2015, 14-ish. Um, so the height of Black Lives Matter, um, one, of the, one of the great things that happened in those moments was that um, the government, local, state, federal, were dumping documents in an effort to be transparent. So this is the first time we're actually getting to look at the mechanisms of, um, of how we're still in this shit. That's I'll just put it that way. I don't even know how to be like academic right now. So, um, so I, I at the time, um, I had Mothers Against Police Brutality had just been founded in Dallas. I had started to organize early with them for a few years, um, and um, I was also reading these trial documents and narrative construction and everything else. And so the thing that kind of struck me, and and so I apologize for those who have heard it already. Um, the thing that struck me was looking at what the claims were, uh, particularly Darren Wilson in, in murdering Mike Brown and George Zimmerman in, mur in murdering Trayvon Martin, what their claims were that they claimed that these 17-year-old black boys, children, said, which was in the case of Wilson, he claimed that Mike Brown said, you are too much of a pussy to shoot me. And then with George Zimmerman, he claimed that George, Trayvon Martin said, you're gonna die tonight, motherfucker. Now, for me and my friends, we were like, that shit didn't happen. Like, there's no way he said, like, there's no way these two boys said this in the middle of this type of altercation. Tra Tra Trayvon Martin was on his back being straddled with a gun. Mike Brown was having a gun pointed at him, according to the, the testimony, and he said this, right? But also, like, so it was like, he didn't, they didn't say this. But what really struck me was like, like the claim that felt so unblack, right? I was like, I was literally like, black, we don't use pussy like that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> like, there are literal right. racial differences. Like, there are, <laughs> okay, okay. They, I mean, you know what I'm saying? I mean, like, okay, thank you. Like, we, <laughs> I, there are literal, we, there's little racial differences 
differences in how we use language, wow. okay? And so what that sounded like to me was the white imaginary of black masculinity. And so what I did was I asked some of my friends, men, to come into the studio and we did these three hour like recording sessions where I just asked them to repeat over and over to try to embody this language. Um, and re repeat these two lines. And like, they couldn't. They wanted, first of all, I made them use the hard R. It was like, motherfucker, you know? <laughs> like you can't say, you know? Like this is what's in the transcript. You know, that's another thing. It's like, motherfucker wouldn't come at the end, but okay. So, um, so they were like having, tr struggling saying these words, saying it exactly. Um, and they were frustrated. And, and I was like, no, you have to say it as if, you know, and, we, and say it like you mean it, say it to embody it. And so it wasn't until they themselves started going to Hollywood could they actually perform it. So literally in one of the, um, in one of the sessions, uh, one, uh, uh, Simon, he was like, how would Denzel say this in training day? And then he said it. And it sounded like that. And mind you, I've done the research now to also like see that there's a line where Denzel, where Denzel says you're too pussy, right? <laughs> so I was like, I mean, I have all these like informal research, you know, I'm not a linguist, but I was just like, look, I can trace like these movies that use pussy and these movies that move, and then don't sound the same, right? And so, um, so it, and so the, the records, I'll play a little bit, uh, just a, a little s snippet for you. They start out really absurd. Two boys, two boys that ate pussy, did you? <laughs> <laughs> they start really absurd because it's boys, absurd. Two boys, two pussy, did you? <laughs> you are two boys that ate pussy to shoot me. And he tries putting the emphasis pussy on different to shoot words. Me. You are two boys of a pussy to shoot me. Okay, so it goes on and on like that. So then, and the next line was. It's a little bit more intense. You're gonna die tonight, motherfucker. You're gonna die tonight, motherfucker. You're gonna die tonight, motherfucker. You're gonna die. So the records start out really absurd, but you, as you can imagine, it's a process piece, and I'm, I'm, we're doing this for a long, like, like it's durational so by the time you if you really sit and listen to the full session it gets really intense right because all the sort of absurdity is out and then you start to feel the weight of those phrases and the claim that was made right so what I did was some of those images you saw in the beginning was from a, a, a solo show um, a, a commercial show and at the time like you know Wilson's verdict had just came down and I was just like I how am I mounting art right now without addressing this, you know? And so I didn't like want to give a space to not think about it. So I decided um, it was sort of, it wasn't at the last minute, but it wasn't part of the original plan um, to cut these records, to, to take these sound and cut them onto acetate. And I sort of, not hid, but stashed off the records um, in different spaces in the gallery. Because it was a new media gallery, it was high tech, so I was able to program so that the, when the visitor came and put the needle on the record, it interrupted the 12 videos that were playing in all of the sound. So I put those records, the recreations on white turntables, but what we did have at the time was the actual audio of what a black victim would sound like, which was Eric Garner, right? So I took that documentation of his murder and I put that, I cut that onto a record and I put that onto a black tur turntable and I put that in the, the space as well. So. You know, we all
there's something about removing this, the image where you really get to hear the voice, right? And I'm like getting chills right now. Um, and I've heard this over and over and over, right? It's, it's still every time. But the cases that we have where the murder is documented, you hear what frustration sounds like. You hear what being exhausted sounds like. You hear what, being, what pleading sounds like. And none of that sounds like what the murderers are claiming that black men are saying. And so that's where the Project American Monument comes out of. So, I'm sorry, <laughs> let me breathe for a second. Um, so I, I cut those records and I put them in the show. They interrupted the space and a, an experiment just started to happen, right? People had to decide whether they were gonna enact those sounds of black death, basically. And it's a choice, right? Because it's interactive. So people would put the needle on the record and they find out what it says and then they had to find out whether they wanted to keep it on there. If there were other people in the space, they had to decide whether they wanted to enact that into the space. And then also, um, because the turntables were all equal level, you could put you could put them all on at one time. And you had to decide whether you were gonna interrupt the viewing um, of uh, uh, how other people were feeling in the space. What people also didn't know, which was another experiment, was that I had programmed that the speakers actually went outside. So they had um, speakers out on the roof. So the sound was actually going for a block, about two block radius, which was in the design district, which is the art district in Dallas. So a completely dis, um, uh, a completely, what is the word? Um, disembodied? Yeah, displaced, disembodied. I mean, this, the, the arts district, they're not, n people there are not aware, not, don't care, don't give a fuck about police violence, and um, are pretty much okay in their bubbles, right? And so this, what people didn't realize is that they were also like circulating the sound, right? And so that became the initial exper experiment. So when, um, in 2018, when Kimberly uh, Meyer first started her tenure over at the UAM and she invited me to do a show, I had already been thinking about, because I just started collecting, like trying to collect as many case documents, because really what I was interested in was the actual narrative construction, right? And you needed the primary sources to get to that. So you could see, like, without it being filtered through reports and everything, what was the imaginary at play in these moments. And so I had always imagined that there'd just be one turntable after another, right? And I'd try to do as many as I could. And so when Kimberly invited me to the UAM, I proposed the project to her and immediately she's like, yeah, let's do it, right? And um, so American Monument, just to give you the formal whatever, blur, it's a multi-part, multimedia participatory work of art that actively transforms existing architecture in a city into a monument that prompts consideration of the cultural circumstances under which Amer African Americans have lost their lives to police brutality. The new media monument is designed to be nomadic and continually expanding, moving across the country year to year, unveiled at universities, museums, storefronts, community centers, and churches. A tool with research, pedagogical, and activist functions, American Monuments claim space to analyze the complex relationship between constructed race, material violence, and structural power in order to contribute to the efforts to end police brutality. So it's really a project on how law is culture and how culture makes law and how there's like, how culture manifests in material, materially into death, right? So that's just like a quick thing. So the first iteration, which was called American Monument 25, 2018, it was set to unveil last year in uh, November at the University Art Museum of California, Long, California State University, Long Beach, um, at the invitation of Kimberly Meyer, who at the time was the director. Shortly after taking office in 2016, Kimberly announced a five-year focus on structural racism and positioned herself, her, leader, her concept of leadership, and directorial mission as addressing injustice and developing an anti-racist museum practice. So I was super excited to be able to support a cultural worker who was critiquing, right, doing institutional critique of our cultural systems from within, right? It wasn't an artist coming outside. It was actually like from the ground up, right? So this is a, um, this is a 
the brochure and the layout for 20, the 2018 edition, as you can see, the idea was that the whole, mo the whole museum was taken over and dedicated as a monument. So um, in the space um, was the central court of the turntables, which is sort of the aesthetic experience of the monument. And then surrounding it would be every sort of contemporary monument has the place of information where you learn about didactically, explicitly what the issue the monument is addressing. So around it was where we would start to build out with the public through think tanks and programs what would go into the place of information. And we were looking at historical pre precedents and the evolving, um, uh, the, evol the evolution of the phrase police brutality through media from the 1800s to the present. So it used to be police brutalities and was tied to the labor movement. And then it became police brutality around the civil rights movement when it's applied to black people. So we were tracing that through newspapers and media. We were also doing uh, open records requests, FOIA requests with a group of students. We had a work group of Cal State Long Beach students. We did over 200 in about six months to try to get things in. And um, we also wanted to look at, what was the other thing? Historical, oh, case law. And to kind of trace like, basically to try to do the translational work to the public of how we are here, right? Like we, we understand, we know it's wrong, we see our social media as feeds, but we don't actually understand the mechanisms unless you're specialized in that area. So the monument was really trying to do some of that work. Um, so because it's a monument, the, and I, we couldn't take the university art museum off of that, but, <laughs> but we put a marker out to like, we use the traditional language of um, historical architectural mark, uh, markers by putting a sled out to dedicate that space. Oh, wait, how did I get here? So, <laughs> so Kimberly, who through the project became my pri primary collaborator, it was fire. I don't know how I got here so fast, wait a minute. Oh yeah, okay, so I was supposed to say, five days before the launch of American Monument, Kimberly, who throughout the project became my, became my primary collaborator, was fired. So this is what I flew into the day of to like launch this project. Kimberly was fired five days out of the launch. Officially on September 11, 2018, Meyer was abruptly terminated from the directorship at the end of a nine intensive months of research and pre-production and five days before the launch of American Mon Monument's public production process, it became clear that her dismissal was directly linked to the racial justice-centered mission and to the structural changes she was attempting to establish. The public production process was launched on September 16th as planned, and I subsequently paused 30 minutes later in protest. To mark the production pause, I turned off the turntables and removed the records. So I'm gonna try to just speed through this. Here are some of the ephemera from that day. I'm not gonna play that one. So I, um, Um, so, I won't, I won't play this either, but, um, so I, I welcomed people into the space, I was on the platform, I started to explain what the monument was, I read the re opening remarks that Kimberly would have delivered, and then at that moment I played the central turntable, which was the recording from Diamond Reynolds, a uh, Facebook recording of her boyfriend Philando Castile's death. So I played that and I stepped off the platform to let people hear sort of one record. And then at that point I delivered my statement which was that um, basically I believe that the university kneecapped the project. So I asserted that the removal of a key collaborator at such a critical junction amounted to institutional violence and censorship in which the administrators of CSULB were attempting to suffocate the effort indirectly. In effect, CSULB had, quote, kneecapped the project that, a project that focused on black lives and police brutality and killed a leadership initiative whose focus was not only to address white supremacy, but to disrupt it. Rather than pull the project, it called for CSULB to enact a restorative process to result in Meyer's reinstatement. Meyer filed an appeal the next day over the course of three months, the sculpture remained silent as hundreds of people signed petitions and many called the CSULB president in protest. In the art world, CSULB was called out as racist. Students organized and protested, town halls were planned, round tables requested, the university administration remained entrenched and the monument was never unpaused and reactivated. So here's some images from that.
not never empty. So the monument never got built out at CSULB. It remained in its um, sort of uh, native state. This was the exit, which we had put out this uh, 300, I think, 300, 300 square feet of red carpet. Um, and those empty vitrines, so this was supposed to be the space that would remember the human costs, right? If the monument's about state violence, we also have to remember that this is tied to people. And so one of the ideas was to uh, do think tanks around how do we start to remember people past the wall of names. And so those empty vitrines theoretically would have been built up as artworks um, in collaboration with local families who lost people to police violence, but their, their family member wasn't represented on the grid. So the statement just remained at the injury desk. And what was amazing though was the student response. So um, because of this, the, the students of color in particular of the art school um, organized in, sort of in, in support of Kimberly's appeal and in support of getting the monument back up. And so that was a pretty amazing thing to witness and help facilitate. So you can see some of the images that happened. Uh, students did artistic responses. So this student like um, hung a bunch of records, each with the name that the 25 names we were uh, cases we were looking at. These are undergrad students and, and some grad students. This student stood outside all day and had people write on her body. This student, um, who actually was a student who had a encounter with museum staff that we can call pretty like a microaggressive um, racist incident. She laid out in front of the museum all day with her writing around her. So now we get to 2019, which is this, this edition. So um, at, the, um, at the launch of the 2018 iteration, David Familian was there. <laughs> I like to tell this story, I'm telling it again. <laughs> David was there, I didn't know it was David at the time, but at the, so I you know, knew that this was happening, which was I was gonna read this statement. Um, I didn't know, I, I know that there was like a lot of support for Kimberly showing up, um, and I, but I didn't know like what that would look like. So you know, we were outside the monument and the dean of the art school was giving her remarks and she hadn't actually ever mentioned Kimberly Meyer. It was like the elephant in the room. And so like all, I'm sitting there, you know, my heart's kind of racing because I know what's about to happen. And in the background, I hear this like man being like, what about Kimberly? And I look over and it's like this guy holding a dog going, like, what about Kimberly, you know? And, and so like literally David kind of started the agitation uh, which was like pretty amazing. And then like everybody that was there was like, yeah, what about your, I mean, it was a very like chill protest, but it was like enough to like um, disrupt and make, make the Dean very like nervous and she couldn't finish her sentences. And like literally it made me feel like at ease with what was about to happen because I was like, oh my God, the, like damn, like support showed up, you know? So, so David immediately reached out to um, Kimberly and I in support and was like, you know, um, if it doesn't work out, like we let's see about bringing it to the bill. So we held off until, like you know, we really were trying to give CSUB the, the chance to come through, right? And mind you, Kimberly was going through her appeal process. I was in the background, sort of facilitating students, and I was still in conversation with the dean and everybody else, administration, for like months. And um, so it really, in, in terms of the media, it wasn't necessarily accurately like portrayed. Like there was a lot of dialogue happening, but on the behalf of the institution, it was clear that it was a lot of um, lip service happening, that they actually had no intention of actually addressing this restoratively in a different kind of way because they were afraid of lawsuits, they were afraid of the union. They finally admitted off the record that this was about Kimberly's initiative they wouldn't say that publicly. Um, so, um, so then it became clear that we were sort of at a stalemate. They even asked me just to come turn it on the last week and I was like, like you're missing the whole point of this, you know? So it literally like ran itself out and then it was packed up. And so it was really important that we keep it, um, the thought was really important that we keep it in this region to respect and honor the relationships we had already started building with CSU of these students, with grassroots communities in Long Beach, 
And so having this opportunity to move it over to UC Irvine seemed amazing, right? And then we got there and it was amazing because all of these departments that intersect, these fields that intersect with the work, the law school, social ecology, criminology, African American studies, um, art, art history, like amazing scholarship and they were all like just super supportive and signed on to be our advisors, signed on to work with us. So we're actually able, so we launched the project and we're actually able to start the work, which is the real experiment, right? Um, so this, so to mark the, to mark this iteration in the Bill Center as the American Monument, they painted it for us. They painted it red, <laughs> which is a big deal. David, I know David was like, <laughs> don't forget the Walmart thing. I'm like, we need a red building. So we, <laughs> we needed to be painted. So they painted the building. We erected the marker of the 22 names that we are. Um, both reflecting on and looking at the cases. Um, we will eventually build out this. So if the monument's about state power, we still have to have this space to like breathe and get away from this and to remember the victims. So this is one of our, will be one of our sort of build outs is like, how are we gonna transform this space into the reflective garden space? I don't have a picture of it, but across from the, um, the, the marker is a custom-made wind chime that's tuned to um, frequencies outside of the Western system. And so as you go inside, you hear sort of the simulation of those wind chimes inside. And that's what is disrupted whenever someone plays the record. So here's a, a map of the inside. As you can see, it's a much smaller space, right? So it became a real experiment to see like, how are we gonna, what are we gonna fit in? How are we gonna work it? How are we gonna do the work groups and the think tanks? Um, and it's a different space because it's an art and technology. It's not like a, the museum that had the huge like natural light and you know, it's more easier to get people to see that be the monument, right? But I really think that, I mean, it's been work, right? <laughs> it's been a lot of work. Um, and transforming the Bill Center meant that like we went from a black box to having the white, the space white. We played with lighting, all of that sort of stuff. And, 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 I, and actually, I think it's, it's a very different feel, but it's pretty amazing. Um, despite the content, we're not talking about the content, but in terms of how the, the space transforms, I think it, it really does feel different. Um, so you, as you can see already, it's different from Cal State Long Beach in terms of the mood. Um, it's very low lighting. So I, I like to talk about stuff in, in like birthing metaphors. So I feel like, you know, the baby was delivered over at Cal State and the nurses and shit fucked it up and like the baby had to go to like NICU. So like, this is like the NICU and this is who's taking care of the baby right now to get it like back where it should have been, right? So with the launch, everything is in place to start the work. The documents, I mean, it was amazing. People were reading even at the launch. Okay, that's it. So, um, <laughs> so I know we don't have a lot of time, but um, I can open up to questions. I kind of sped through American Monument. There was, I mean, that was a lot. <laughs> you guys all to come. We're going to be um, uh, doing different public uh, think tanks. So we have, just to give you, I'm, my brain's really dead, but just to give you an idea of some, some of the people that are coming. Can you, can yeah, you um, say okay, so On Monday, this one that's coming up Monday is John Carullo. This is going to do a close read of the Sandra Bland case. Um, it's going to be from 5 to 30 this coming Monday. I'm going to put all this stuff on the Beale website, but like we've got somebody who's, um, we've got James Lamb who's from the who's going to be doing um, something on the 21 foot rule, which we want to go into quite a bit, um, which is essentially a non-scientific rule of thumb that came out of some training magazine from the 70s that tells people, that tells cops how, um, how far away somebody can be in order to feel, feel um, fine about shooting them. So he's going to he's gonna discuss the myths of those and kind of go into that a little bit. And that's how these tables are actually laid out to sort of um, um, make physical the, those numbers. So that's what that is. So 21 feet and then Laquan McDonald was shot walking away in the back 17 feet and then a woman here in LA, an, an elderly woman downtown LA in 1999 was shot at 
five to eight feet away. So those three, uh, those three cables represent those, those distances. So yeah, John is going to be talking about that. Um, we've got some. We've got a link list coming out from Pomona. We're also going to talk about San Andreas Land, about like about like how um, black women are perceived as angry. Mm -hmm. um, we've got somebody. Um, we've got Sora Han who's going to be talking about um, sound and um, the law and and the, and the law in relationship to Oscar Grant's murder at, in the BART station in Bay Area. So those mm -hmm. are a handful. Yeah. So we've got people who really know a lot about what's going on with these cases, because then based on their own expertise and their own research, they just do a really close read on one of the 22 cases mm -hmm. that, that Lauren has brought into the, mm -hmm. into the field. So, and so to give you an example of how that works, so John Murillo, he's African American studies, he's an Afro-pessimist, so his specialty is looking at the construction. No, I mean, <laughs> He's, um, his, his, I, you know, black pes the Afro pessimists are like so black social death and all of that. So he's really looking at through these legal and official documents the construction of black masculinity and the white imaginary. So he's through his, with his expertise, he's looking at these documents, right? And then of course the legal scholars are looking at things a different sort of way, right? So the idea is that all of these people from different fields are using the same material and shedding light. On, um, on this material through different uh, lenses. And the idea is that the co-production co of knowledge of these think tanks actually become the, what gets built out in the monument, right? So um, information's collected, knowledge thoughts are collected, I, um, uh, interventions are made on the texts that are there, depending on what comes out of these um, think tanks. And then what actually goes onto the walls are also coming from these think tanks. And so the idea is that by February, we'll have a new monument that needs that will actually be unveiled. So this is the unfinished monument that launched, the, the, the production process launch. And then we'll signal the end of the residency um, of American Monument at UCI by unveiling the complete, uh, the complete thing. And we'll have like a symposium and a whole bunch of like activities in February. On the, it's February, it ends February 8th, so it will be that weekend? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Right. Black History Month. Yeah, the beginning of Black History Month. Mm -hmm. um, so we pushed it to be there. Uh-huh. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Monument really um, is my dive into wanting to understand structurally, specifically everything that's happened. So it's like you know, being a culture worker, we understand how culture works, right? I mean, okay, let me rewind. The thing that happened between so I and the prize was really seminal for me in terms of my consciousness. But then working on drinking fountain number one became a moment where I was like, hold up, like everything is like everything's changing, right? Because with the drinking fountain number one, part of that research was going into different archives to look firsthand at the newsreel and not at the sort of curated idea of the civil rights movement, right? So the historic the civil rights movement was historicized in film in that time period, late 80s into the 90s which for my generation um, meant that we had an idea of the civil rights movement that was like downtrodden and like filled with like spirituals like me, <laughs> you know, and for like me, like my generation, I think a lot of us felt like, especially, you know, civil rights movement happened, black power movement happened, like the debate between like nonviolence and violence, right? Or nonviolence and by any means necessary. Like I think for my generation, it was like, that was the, the ways of our grandparents that didn't work, right? And I do think that's primarily because Hollywood, Hollywood dies did, you know? So when I looked at the actual newsreel footage, I was like, well shit, like this is nothing like what I saw with all of the like melancholy music. Like people were fierce, right? Um, I on the prize for that like, um, for that PBS, like it's really slow, like if anybody's seen it, you know the song, it's like, he, Right? When you hear like it used in the movement, 
It feels like any movement that you've seen, Black Lives Matter, BYP 100, Dream Defenders, it feels like the same energy. Like people were like fierce, like singing it fast and hard, curlers and all, right? And then also like to, con so for every image I saw that was like the beautiful strategy of nonviolence, which was a strategy for the media and for the image, right? But we don't actually understand or learn why that strategy like worked then. Um, so for every image you saw like that, you also saw like black people resisting in multiple kinds of ways. So if you remember like the famous image of the dude in the nice suit getting spat on by a bunch of white dudes, like I saw footage where like this, this dude, this white dude was like trying to like call this dude a nigger and the dude was like, motherfucker, blah, 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 you know, like, and I was like, well shit, that wasn't an eye on the prize, you know, so like, <laughs> you know, like, you know, so I was like, it really gave me like a more like holistic sense. And I think that was some of what Black Lives Matter in terms of discourse was trying to push. Like, it's not about respectability, right? And actually it never was, right? Like the strategy of nonviolence was a strategy of performance for the media intentionally, right? But it didn't necessarily, it wasn't it. So I think that that moment was really my like moment of like understanding the, the like, real like the effect of even culture and shaping like new generations consciousness of like movement you know and i think it's that so it becomes really important to like see those primary images like uncurated unedited right because also while the beautiful strategy of nonviolence was like amazing for that time period it trained up a whole generation generations of people to believe that that's the way it had to go right and that we should be doing that the same way now right so um, anyway, that was, a, that was a very like, I don't know. I don't know how, I don't know what I'm, I mean, I, I, it, it, white supremacy. Like, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know. I don't think that I've like, like, I think that I understood at that moment at seven that like, I mean, mind you, I grew up in Texas. My family's from the Midwest, but we moved there when I was young. My first instances with racism, I, I was actually looked this girl up on Facebook today because I remember her. My best friend in second grade, Brandy Graves, I shouldn't have said her name, but she's not on Facebook. Um, she, she was a, you know, a, I went to a very like racially diverse school. She was a white uh, little girl and we were best friends in second grade. And she came to me and she's like, I really want to invite you to my birthday party. My mom won't let, my dad, mom and dad won't let me invite anyone who's black, you know? And, and that was like second grade, you know? So from that moment on, Right, if not before, I've always had like sort of an awareness, and my parents did. My parents were activists, so they never kept anything. They were very clear, um, and I think seeing it through eyes on the prize made me understand how, um, and that just like built ever since there. So I think it's like wanting to really do. I'm, you know, I'm. I, I like didn't go to law school. Maybe I should have. I don't know. But I think now I'm just really wanting to do like real a deep dive into the, struct the structural analysis and like basically surround myself with like people who do that to really be able to understand. And I think that culture and art can actually act as that translator. You know. Sorry, I was like rambling. Uh -huh. <laughs> I mean, I love to hear it's like steeped in black. I didn't think my work's steeped in blackness. I don't, my work's about whiteness. So maybe white people don't want to come in. Is that what you're saying? Like, I don't know. Like, I, I mean, no. So I, no, the, I mean, I'm, I'm a trained artist. Like, this is a skill set I have. 
you know, so there are many codes to the work, whether it's like art historical like references that like artists would know and the cultural world would know. But I think the, the, the space I play in in terms of monumentality is my attempt to sort of like, mul like fuse multiple worlds together because we think about monuments as non-art, you know, where, but it is. It's using the technology that's been built up over time through artists and artisans, or by artists and artisans, but it's in the public sphere and it's made to be palatable in a certain way. And so there's like an ease and to people feel more comfortable there going there than to like an art gallery, right? So I actually haven't had the experience of like non-black people not being able to enter into the work. What non-black people don't realize is that my work is not about blackness, it's about whiteness. And, you know, even if I say that to a writer, they still write, it's about blackness. I'm like, no, it's not, you know? So it's because for me, blackness, and I'm not talking about black people, I'm not talking about Africanness. I'm talking about the concept of blackness grows out of the white imaginary. It's, 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 it's the same, it's one and the same. And we haven't figured out linguistically how to like talk about that, that thing, right? That's like, we know it's apart from white whiteness. So we call it like black with a capital B maybe. I don't know, like, or we call it blackness and not black. I don't know, but either, but what I'm saying in terms of racially and, sy and systemic racism and all that, which is what my interest is, whether I'm looking at it through culture or law or whatever, it's about the white imaginary, you know? Well, do you think the language that you're Okay. Do you believe that the work, the language that you are using to describe that work, the white imaginary that you say, is the language mm -hmm. that you're sort of like putting out there? Is it doing that work for you? Language in terms of like what I say around the work, or the language well, in terms of the codes? Alone, so the work that you display, or the work that we've discussed. Mm -hmm. For me, as, you know, as a black person as well, like yeah. speaking really loosely, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, if we look at some of the discourse around Confederate monuments, there's no a debate specific. on whether it's art or not. No specific monuments, okay, because I guess for me, when I think of monuments- Well, art with a capital A, that's, com that, that's part of- Vietnam Memorial, yeah. Myelin because it was one of the first spatial monuments that's like that was like a break in what was before but we have lots of spatial monuments now that we don't study or even think of when we talk about like art high art right so I think that public art in general rides this sort of like fine line in terms of how the capital A art world pulls it in or pushes it out I mean we can debate about it but I mean that's just my opinion I mean so let me let me clarify um, drinking fountain number one definitely, I think, was uh, or is it, it, it's to honor the spirit of activism. So I wouldn't say that's like about the white imaginary. I think I think I'm thinking about my video work. Um, a lot of my earlier video work definitely is about the ma and white imaginary, and it gets written at it gets written about as being about blackness. But I'm looking at white people. So I'm like literally returning the gaze in a lot of my early video work. So in that way, I guess I just wanted to keep the idea that I'm working with whiteness. But the American Monument is that. I don't think American, I, I actually struggle with where American Monument goes when it comes to it being a black space. I actually don't feel like right now, I haven't reconciled that it needs to be in a black space. I don't know that it's for black people right now because I don't think that this is our problem to solve, but we're forced to, right? So I think even the aesthetically, I'm speaking like Western art codes that are nowhere near the codes of what we, call, what we would think is like the black imaginary in terms of art and culture making. You can disagree with me, I, I love it. But I'm just like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, but I, I would love to say that I'm making black work. I just don't think I am. Because I, I don't know, I think that there's a, a certain level of, there's a certain level of home that I don't feel like my work feels like. And I don't know how to describe it any other way than to say that. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for um, your talk tonight. What, because part of the language that you use is of monuments, especially with the installation of the Field Center with the reflective you know, mm -hmm. um, material and the names, I mean, I think that kind of directly calls, kind of recalls like Lionel Lynn and yeah. all those folks. Um, the other language you use is one of archives. Mm -hmm. and I was kind of looking through kind of archival boxes and documents and doing the FOIA request, which I think is a really kind of interesting kind mm -hmm. of I'm wondering how you think about how the project itself becomes archived and in, in, in other kind of installations, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. and how all of that work that's been do, done kind of in the think tanks and around the yeah. documents, which obviously stay on, if you're local collaborators, they stay on kind of in the mm -hmm. workings and in the lives of local collaborators, but I'm wondering how does what is produced out of that work travel mm -hmm. with this project to whatever next location it's a, it's yeah. maybe an archival question, but I don't no, know. No, it is. I mean, yeah. like, literally, that's like in the, the hidden arm, and that's actually what the Bill Center is going to be facilitating. So the archive will actually live with the Bill Center, hopefully, in perpetuity. Yeah, right? uh, and we're working um, with informatics and um, other <coughs> departments in creating a, a website that will be the archive, uh -huh. and, be, and then we'll structure it so each location it goes to will have its own. Uh, version and um, but I'm actually having a meeting with someone to talk about I want, I'm thinking of having a little have some go beyond just a normal archive in the way that it um, um, the site itself could do close readings mm -hmm. in I some mean, way the and, uh, using the close readings that are being done at each location mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean the, the idea is that all of this so particularly with four year requests and everything it's like how to create this public archive that becomes useful to the movement. And so that's, al that's always been the uh, concept from the beginning is that this, is, this work is, we're translating, we're dumping, we're doing, you know, we're grant money, university resources to pay for open records requests that then become open to the public. And this becomes important for grassroots organizations that don't have funding. This has becomes important for families whose 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 loved ones didn't become a hashtag, mm -hmm. and they don't have enough money to like pay a thousand dollars for a bunch of documents, and they're being like thwarted by getting it. Um, so the idea is that actually like that's also part of the activism of the project. And, and I guess maybe one one mm -hmm. like one follow up question, which is then what what your response is making me also think is that the archive is itself. A Yeah. Folks, well, yeah. I think like in terms of like the actual physical mm -hmm. boxes. Yeah, so yeah, the yeah. thing is, is like, you know, those are um, the documentation of our records request, whatever mm -hmm. we get back. But it's also not your like normal, like cold objective, like document because like the subjective comes into it. So what I, I've gone through all the cases mm -hmm. I've highlighted, which like I have questions about. Um, and that becomes part of the, like, so that's the next thing I have to do is go back and make my drawings on there. But also all the think tanks, anything that comes out of that, like, well, so there's an intervention on the actual record. And, you know, my, the, I was on a, um, a panel, like, last year where Ben Davis asked this question about, like, truth and post-truth and all that. And I'm just like, okay, cool. Like, I don't know what to say about all of that, but I, I do know that, like, I don't know if I'm as interested in truth as I am really interested in the record, because the record has power. Um, so the archive contains the record. And so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're at time.